Okay, this week we're going to speak on our created stars and galaxies, and we'll look at a little bit of the Big Bang Theory and compare it to what the Bible teaches. The outline for today, we'll talk about cosmological evolution, star formation, and show how the star formation basically disproves a lot of the Big Bang Theory, the galaxy formation, three purposes of the heavens, Point five is message of the heavens. Which model fits the universe, biblical creation or evolution? And the spiritual message of the heavens. Look at some of the atheistic, naturalistic viewpoints and compare them with what the Bible teaches as well. A lot of the stuff I'm using today is from this video called Created Stars and Galaxies from Spike Pizarus. And I'll be playing some clips from him. He worked for the government as an astronomer and uh, he was actually an uh, evolutionist, and he became a creationist and a Christian by uh, understanding some of the creation views, and he became converted. So he's able to p apply a lot he learned in the government to uh, what the Bible teaches. Uh, hopefully this will be a blessing for you guys. Also, I'll be using a clip from Jason Lyle's Astronomy Reveals Creation. So... The Bible teaches in Genesis 1.1, in the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. And Genesis 1.16, he made the stars also. It's almost like, you know, no big deal. You know, God, he made the stars. It's not that, you know, tough for the Lord. But when we kind of walk through this, you'll see how amazing the stars and the galaxies are. So when we talk about evolution... We have three layers. You have the biological evolution, which addresses life, geological evolution, which addresses the Earth, and the cosmological evolution, which deals with the planet, stars, and galaxies. And that's what we'll be send, spending the four weeks on, the cosmological evolution. Now, why do we say evolution for out in the cosmos? Well, in all the astronomy textbooks from 1994 to 2013, the seculars use evolution and all the astronomy textbooks. So that's why we say evolution also in astronomy. So what does the evolutionary thinking use? They use the Big Bang, and they say the Big Bang started 13.7 years ago. The Big Bang model teaches that the universe started out as a hot, dense point, which suddenly ballooned in size and eventually expanded to the size it is today. The early universe then had a lot of hydrogen and helium clouds that came from this Big Bang. So the early, early universe had nothing in it but hydrogen and helium gas. Eventually the gas began to clump together. Within the clumps there were areas of higher density and those areas began to contract under the influence of gravity. And you can see this in the video. As the clouds contracted, the gas was compacted and it heated up. And eventually the gas was squeezing in on itself so tightly that nuclear fusion ignited deep inside. And this is what they say uh, created the first star. And then, so the first stars began to appear, appear about 13.2 billion years ago. Other stars began to turn on early in the universe. And then once you develop stars, then galaxies started to appear about 8 to 11 billion years ago. As stars formed, they gathered into clusters of galaxies. Exactly how this happened is still controversial. Most secular astronomers would agree that stars merged into clusters, then clusters merged into galaxies, and then galaxies merged to become bigger galaxies. Somewhere between 7 to 9 billion years ago, our Milky Way galaxy began to form. And then solar system, our solar system formed so about four to six billion years ago. Our sun began to form when a cloud of gas and dust collapsed. The planets of our solar system formed from the same cloud, including the Earth. So here's a summary of what I just covered. The Big Bang Theory, it started from nothing or a cosmic egg. Then we had the Big Bang explosion 3.7 billion years ago. Hydrogen helium clouds. Stars began to form 13, 10 to 13 billion years ago, and then eventually our solar system, 4 to 6 billion years ago. So we'll go into star formation. Okay, So if the Big Bang theory is correct, 
then it should be able to produce stars. We'll examine that closer. This, di this picture is the Hubble Space Telescope is able to go far into the universe and take pictures. And here's a picture of what's called the Mystic Mountain, the Carina Nebula. We are told that there are many locations of star formation like this location. Evolutionists like to point to regions like this for support for their model. But it's actually a logic, logical fallacy. Whether or not stars are forming in the universe today or whether they could form in the universe today is not really the question. If the universe formed itself without a creator being involved, would we see stars today? And the answer is no. That might be, might be why. Well, we'll get into this. Because gas pressure is stronger than gravity. In the Big Bang model, stars are supposed to form from clouds of gas as gravity squeezes the gas together to form stars. There's a problem. A cloud of gas in space will not collapse to stars on its own. Because gravity is a weak force, much weaker than gas pressure, which forces the gas molecules apart. So, I'll, I'll use a demonstration. I have a can of compressed air here, and I'll give you a gas pressure demonstration. When I pull the trigger, it opens the passage from outside the can to inside the can. What happens when the gas in this can of compressed air can travel freely? Does it go in or go out? out because gas always disperses from area of high pressure inside this can to areas of low pressure outside of the can. How much gas would you think you would need inside this can to create such a strong gravitational force when I pull the trigger the air doesn't go outside the can it gets sucked inside the can and we all you know asphyxiate and die because there's lack of air you know that would be almost impossible right or if I pulled the trigger and it sucked all the air in but that's what you would need this kind of concentration of gas is what you need to form stars from a gas cloud in space you can't maintain a gas cloud at higher pressure than its surrounding unless you keep it in a container like this this can is a container, so the gas stays inside. It's being compressed inside without dispersing. You have to pull, but the gas wants to leave this container. But there aren't containers like this in space. So there's nothing that prevents gas clouds from dis dissipating and dispersing. There's other things that will prevent a gas cloud from collapsing into stars. One evolution evolutionist wrote, we know the cloud wants to collapse under its own weight to make one or more stars, but rotation is a way to stop it, as well as turbulent motion within the cloud work against that fate. So too does the ordinary gas pressure you learned about in high school chemistry class. Galactic magnetic fields also fight against gas clouds collapsing. They penetrate the cloud, latch onto any free-roaming charged particles contained therein, restricting the ways in which the cloud will respond to its self-gravity. So then you may ask, if this gas is dispersing and not collapsing into star, how can stars exist? Stars are much denser, and they're smaller than the gas clouds in space. Gravity is stronger when you have high densities and smaller distances. If there's enough gas in a small enough volume, gravity is strong enough to overcome gas pressure. This is why the stars are stable, though they're made of gas. Interstellar gas clouds are too large and diffuse for gravity to overcome gas pressure. Therefore, they will not collapse and form stars, but they disperse instead. Evolutionists know that this is true, so how do they explain this? I'll show you a clip. They will... Uh, Spike Pizarus will go over five scenarios what secular star, uh, the seculars say will form stars in their models. But watch. As you listen to this, think of you need stars to exist before these models can actually happen. So I'll play this. It goes like four minutes. First, they suggest that compression can overcome gas pressure. 
and allow stars to form. The compression would come from a supernova. Supernovae are tremendous explosions in space. For a short time, they can produce as much energy as an entire galaxy. They're incredibly violent. For example, the Crab Nebula is the remnant of a supernova that occurred in the year 1054. This supernova was so bright that it was visible during the daytime for more than three weeks. Supernovae are thought to trigger star formation when one explodes close to a gas cloud. This creates a shock front, which compresses the cloud, overcoming the gas pressure. Gravity then takes over and compresses the cloud further, and stars begin to form. The second explanation is cooling. When a supernova occurs, it might also inject dust grains and particles into the cloud, or the grains can get there from other ways. The dust cools down the cloud, which reduces gas pressure and again allows stars to form. A third possibility is collisions, where the gas cloud gets compressed when something else collides with it. This can occur when galaxies collide with each other, as you see in this example here. A fourth possible explanation comes from black holes. Some evolutionists suggest that black holes emit jets of high-speed material, which crash into gas clouds and trigger star formation. A final possibility is that radiation from a cluster of newborn stars can trigger star formation within nearby gas clouds. So evolutionists have several explanations for star formation today. But notice something important about these explanations. They all require stars to exist before more stars can be made. Supernovae occur when old stars explode. According to the Big Bang model, interstellar dust grains also come from existing stars. The model can't account for them otherwise. Black holes are thought to form when massive stars run out of fuel or have certain other things happen to them. And before galaxies can collide, they first have to exist, and they're made up of stars too. The same is true for radiation from newborn stars. This is a huge problem for the secular model. The Big Bang can't make any stars until stars already exist. It's like the classic riddle of the chicken and the egg. You need chickens to make eggs, and you need eggs to make chickens. The Big Bang model has this problem on a much larger scale, a universal scale. It can't make stars until stars were already made. After considering all these star formation problems, you can see why evolutionists are saying things like this. The origin of stars represents one of the most fundamental unsolved problems of con contemporary astrophysics. There are so many uncertainties in this picture that at present we do not really have a theory of star formation. If stars do not exist, it would be easy to prove that this is what we expect. Literally hundreds of ideas on how stars are formed have been advanced in the past decades. However, we are still far from any real solution. We're starting from a shaky foundation. We don't understand how a single star forms, yet we want to understand how 10 billion stars form. If none of us knew in advance that stars exist, frontline research would offer plenty of convincing reasons for why stars could never form. The next time you admire the night sky, remember this. All the stars you see and billions more that you don't see all defy the evolutionary model just by existing. So the, the evolutionists have a rescuing device. And the rescuing device that they're using now is dark matter and dark energy. And Spike Pizarus will talk about that. They'll say this problem has been solved because there were some announcements recently that claimed that it was. For example, here's a report about a computer simulation that supposedly showed how the very first star could form. And here's another. But here's what they aren't telling you. These simulations all require something called dark matter. And if you ask an evolutionist what dark matter is, they'll tell you they don't know. Many astronomers believe that there's a lot of stuff in the universe that we can't see. There's supposed to be a huge amount of it, five times as much as all the stars and galaxies and everything else that we do see in space. But if you ask where all this matter is, they'll tell you it's invisible. It emits no light. It emits no radio waves. It emits no x-rays or infrared radiation. It's unlike everything else we know. But it must exist, or else their models don't work. For now, I just want to point out that in order to explain where the first stars came from, evolutionists have to invoke things that nobody has ever seen, and that nobody has any idea what it is or how it works. 
as a cosmologist recently told the BBC. We don't know what the dark matter is. We don't know what the first stars are. If we bring these two problems together, when we know more about one, then we can say something about the other. Well, that doesn't work. Being ignorant about two things at the same time doesn't teach you anything about either one. If we don't know what dark matter is, how it works, where it came from, whether or not it could even have been formed by the alleged Big Bang, how it behaves, whether or not it interacts with ordinary matter outside of gravity, or anything else, then how can we make it part of a scientific model? The only reason dark matter can supposedly rescue star formation for the evolutionists is because nobody knows what it is, or has any definitive evidence for how it might work. So evolutionists are putting it in their models and claiming it can do all sorts of wonderful things because nobody can prove that it can't do all these wonderful things. But that's not how science is supposed to work. And even then, scientists have realized that not even dark matter can rescue the Big Bang from all its problems. So evolutionists also believe in something called dark energy. Together, dark matter and dark energy must be about 96% of the universe, or the Big Bang model can't work. But neither dark matter nor dark energy has a solid basis in physics. As the director of the Canadian Institute for Theoretical Astrophysics said, We know the total matter content of the universe. It's 4%. That's the stuff we recognize as matter. The rest is something we don't understand. There was an article in the New York Times that talked about this. It talked about how the Big Bang cosmology depends on dark matter and dark energy. The article asked, what is dark energy anyway? And then it said, the difficulty in answering that question has led some cosmologists to ask an even deeper question. Does dark energy even exist? Or is it perhaps an inference too far? Cosmologists have another saying they like to cite. You get to invoke the tooth fairy only once, meaning dark matter. But now we have to invoke the tooth fairy twice, meaning dark energy. So evolutionists make jokes about how their model doesn't work unless you invoke the tooth fairy. Meanwhile, the public schools are teaching our children that the Big Bang model is true. There is a serious problem here. So <clears throat> we'll cover a little bit more on dark matter, dark energy. Uh, we talk about uh, distant starlight, but uh, hopefully you get the, the point. Now the next section is galaxy formation. The evolutionary model can explain how stars form. Let's see how well it does with galaxy formation. So a galaxy is basically a large group of stars. Evolutionists believe galaxies started as a small collection of stars, then merged into larger and larger collections until the galaxies were formed. Problem, if your model can't make stars, then you can't make galaxies either. According to the Big Bang, there shouldn't even be 100 billion or so galaxies in the universe. Even if stars could somehow be formed, getting galaxies to form from the Big Bang would be a problem. Evolutionary astronomers admit this is true. One evolutionist wrote, It has always been difficult for astronomers to explain why stars are clumped into galaxies instead of spread out more uniformly in space. There shouldn't be galaxies out there at all. And even if there are galaxies, they shouldn't be grouped together the way they are. The problem of explaining the existence of galaxies has proved to be one of the thorniest in cosmology. By all rights, they shouldn't be there. Yet there they sit. It's hard to convey the depth of frustration that this simple fact induces among scientists. Another says, The formation of galaxies and larger scale structure remains T-M-U-P-I-M-A, the most important unsolved problem in modern astrophysics. Another says, Nearly a century after the true nature of galaxies was established, their origin and evolution remain great unsolved problems of modern astrophysics. Also, the spiral arms should not exist in these galaxies if they're billions of years old. We covered this last year. Um, the spiral galaxies appear like they're rotating. Think of like a hurricane in weather or nor'easter. Um, spiral galaxies can't keep their winding shape they can't last billions of years and look like that. The spiral arms rotate. The intersections rotate faster than the outer bands. So inside, universe, or inside the uh, galaxy, this is rotating faster than the outer bands. Spiral structure becomes tighter and tighter before dissipating. Just like a hurricane develops, you know, it, it 
strengthens, has the eye, and it eventually weakens with time. Same concept. At one billion years, the galaxy would be twisted beyond recognition, and we wouldn't even see these spiral arms. So evolution says galaxies are 10 billion years old. So this is actually 10 times the max age due to the theoretical max from the winding problem. So what we see out there right now is consistent with thousands of years and not billions of years. Notice the blue color. See these little blue color? That indicates blue stars. And I'll show you why that's important. Here's blue stars. That's a fact from Institute Creation Research videos. It goes about two minutes. The three bright blue stars that make up Orion's belt look pretty small up in the night sky. But actually, blue stars are some of the most massive and brightest stars in the whole universe. Stars burn hydrogen for fuel, and blue stars have a lot of hydrogen. Our sun has enough hydrogen to keep burning for around 10 billion years. Blue stars have much more than that, but they won't last as long because they burn through it so much faster. Many blue stars shine 200 times brighter than our sun because they burn their fuel so quickly. Blue stars are like SUVs. They have a big gas tank, but very poor mileage, and they illuminate all parts of the night sky. How do so many short-lived stars exist in a universe that is supposedly 13.8 billion years old? Secular scientists think that stars constantly form as a result of gas clouds being compressed together, even though none of them have ever seen this. Plus, gas particles and clouds bounce against one another. This outward force far exceeds the inward pulling force of gravity. Blue stars churn through their own fuel so fast that they cannot last billions of years. And based on their observed luminosity, the most massive blue stars cannot last even one million years before running out of fuel. If the universe is 13.8 billion years old, as secularists claim, blue stars should not be here anymore. But they are, and we find them all throughout the universe. As God said through his prophet Isaiah, my hands stretched out the heavens, and all their hosts I have commanded. Blue stars fit perfectly with the Bible's idea of recent creation. So next time you see a blue star, think of our creator, whose hands created the whole universe. Okay, <clears throat> so the Bible also teaches the universe is expanding. And Dr. Jason Lyle will talk more about that. And he'll also introduce when the Bible touches on the expanding universe, we didn't witness that until Hubble came into existence in the 1920s. So the Bible was correct for a couple thousand years before science caught up. People say the Bible's not an astronomy textbook. I know that, but when, it's the word of God. And when it touches on astronomy, it's right. God knows how the universe works. He made it after all. I believe the expansion of the universe is taught in scriptures as well. It says that God stretches out the heavens as a curtain, spreads them out as a tent to dwell in, indicating that God has apparently made the universe a little bigger than it was when he first created it. He stretched it out. And that might have been hard to believe when it was written. Again, Isaiah 700 BC, something like that. Because up until, really up until the 1500s, 1600s around there, most of the scientific experts thought the universe was static and eternal. They thought it was unchanging and could not be changed. It would have been really hard for them to believe it's expanding, and it certainly doesn't look like it's expanding. If you go out tonight, it looks big, and you go out tomorrow night, it looks about just as big. It doesn't look like it's been stretched out. But it was in the 1920s that some astronomers came along, and from measuring redshifts of galaxies, they said, it looks like Every, it looks like, it looks like the universe is being expanded or stretched out. How about that? Something that the Bible speaks of millennia earlier. Very interesting. Now, some people have said, well, wait a minute, Dr. Lyle, does this, does this mean that there was a big bang? Because if you got all the galaxies moving away from each other, doesn't that mean that they all go back to a point? Does that mean that they exploded into existence 13.7 billion years ago? And the answer is no. Just because something's getting bigger doesn't mean it exploded into existence billions of years ago. Some of you are getting bigger. That doesn't mean you exploded into existence billions of years ago. <laughs> Not at all. Apparently, God made the universe with some size, and he stretched it out a bit since then. We don't know how much. He doesn't say. But uh, there's no indication that the universe was ever a point 
like the Big Bang folks believe. Some people have said, well, at least this confirms the Big Bang, right? Because the Big Bang, didn't it predict that the universe would be expanding? And lo and behold, observations show the universe is expanding. Doesn't that count as a successful prediction? And the answer is no, because the uh, expansion of the universe was discovered in the 1920s. The Big Bang idea, the idea that the universe came from a point, was invented in 1931 as an explanation for that expansion, a secular explanation, really. The inventor of it did believe in God, but he believed that science and God were separate, and he wanted to explain the origin of the universe in natural terms. So it, it's not a confirmation of the Big Bang, not at all. Okay. So the Bible was ahead of science. We also have another issue with the, uh, the telescopes, you know, out in space. They can, look out in the they can look out through the universe, and they can go very deep into the universe. We have an early mature galaxies problem, which the Big Bang says if you go far enough into the universe, if you go back, say, you know, several billions of light years, you can see maybe maturing galaxies or galaxies before they were created. Well, Spike answers this uh, issue. There's an additional problem that's been getting worse lately. As technology improves, we're able to look farther out into the universe than ever before. The Big Bang model makes predictions about what we should be seeing out there, but the galaxies we're seeing aren't matching the Big Bang's predictions. We can now see galaxies that are so far away, they can only be seen by using the world's most powerful telescopes. Evolutionists calculate that these galaxies are so far away that their light would have taken billions of years to get here. Therefore, they figure that when we see these distant galaxies, we're seeing them as they were billions of years ago. In fact, evolutionists believe that as we look farther out, we'll see galaxies as they used to be, farther back in time. So as we look farther and farther out, we will see galaxies as they used to be, closer and closer to the Big Bang. Well, the Big Bang model makes predictions about what these things should look like. It turns out that some of these objects do look different in some interesting ways, but they aren't matching the Big Bang's predictions. Evolutionist astronomers had calculated that galaxies formed 8 to 11 billion years ago. That's because according to the secular model, it takes three to six billion years for galaxies to form. So, as we started to look farther out into the universe, evolutionists expected to start finding immature galaxies that were still forming. But that's not what has happened. As we've looked farther and farther out, we're discovering mature galaxies at farther and farther distances. This has been called the early mature galaxies problem. We're finding mature galaxies where the Big Bang model says there shouldn't be any. For example, in 2004, astronomers announced the discovery of 300 mature galaxies that are so far distant that evolutionists believe we're seeing them as they were just three to six billion years after the Big Bang. The problem is that the Big Bang model predicted that only a handful of galaxies could have formed in such a short time. One secular astronomer said, we expected to find basically zero massive galaxies beyond about nine billion years ago because theoretical models predict that massive galaxies form last. Instead, we found highly developed galaxies that just shouldn't have been there, but are. Another astronomer commented, it's not quite time for theorists to panic, but we're getting there. Another group announced they had observed a group of galaxies that existed only two and a half billion years after the Big Bang. But contrary to secular expectations, they were not only massive, but also very old. The astronomer said, we are really amazed these are the earliest, oldest galaxies found to date. Their existence was not predicted by theory. We're detecting galaxies we never expected to find, having a wide range of properties we never expected to see. Then the mature galaxy problem got worse again, with the discovery of five large galaxies that the Big Bang says shouldn't be there. According to the secular interpretation, we're seeing them as they were just 1.7 billion years after the Big Bang. The report in Science talked about evolutionary models for star formation and complained, but this process was supposed to take billions of years. It quoted one of the astrophysicists on the team who said, we have no idea why these galaxies grew so large so soon. Not only that, the Spitzer Space Telescope team has found galaxies which supposedly had already formed just one billion years after the Big Bang. Then in 2007, Astronomers announced the discovery of galaxies which had already formed just 500 million years after the Big Bang, just one half of one billion. The Big Bang model says stars were barely beginning to form this early, yet here are hundreds of billions of them 
already collected into galaxies. And the discoveries have continued. In 2008, one report said, the presence of such fully evolved galaxies so early in the life of the cosmos is hard to explain and has been a major puzzle to astronomers studying how galaxies form and evolve. The farther out we look, the more we see that the universe does not match the Big Bang model. Now I hope I haven't confused you here by talking about these objects having formed millions or billions of years after the Big Bang. I don't believe the Big Bang model. Although most evolutionary astronomers believe in the Big Bang, many are also admitting that the Big Bang has serious problems explaining what we see. For example, a completely satisfactory theory of galaxy formation remains to be formulated. It is rather embarrassing that no one has explained their origins. Most astronomers and cosmologists freely admit that no satisfactory theory of galaxy formation has been formulated. In other words, a major feature of the universe is without explanation. There is something badly wrong with our standard picture of the origin of galaxies. So we should ask, how much can the evolutionary model explain anyway? Now we see that the model also can't explain stars. This means our sun shouldn't exist. Neither should the other stars in the Milky Way. Neither should the stars we see elsewhere. Neither should globular clusters. And neither should galaxies, or clusters of galaxies. And I've just listed the contents of the entire universe. The secular model fails to explain anything we see in space. The universe defies the evolutionary model just because it exists. Okay, hopefully you understood some of that. Farther we look into space, we see the mature galaxies just like those up close. And we'll get into this, the light time travel issue in a few weeks. So now transition to the three purpose of the heavens. Signs and seasons, as the Bible teaches. Sustaining life, the sun. And declaring his glory. Genesis 1.14 says, And God said, Let there be lights in the firmament of the heaven to divide the day from the night and let them be for signs and for seasons and for days and years. And then we have that with the rotation of the earth that defines one day. It rotates every 24 hours. And the months defined by the moon uh, revolving around the earth, one month cycle. And the year and the seasons are defined with the earth rotating around the sun and the axis of the earth giving us the four seasons. Sailors and farmers relied on this in the past. Sailors used the sun and stars to tell time to navigate their ships for thousands of years before we had modern technology. Farmers used the heavens for decision support regarding the planting and harvesting of their crops. For example, Egyptians knew when to plant their crops by looking for the star Sirius to appear each year. And it appeared just before summer started in the summer solstice, solstice, heralding the coming rise of the Nile upon which Egyptian agriculture depended. Also, the sun helps sustain life. The sun is crucial to life on our planet. The sun provides life-sustaining energy. It also uh, provides food. Plants convert sun's energy into sugars and starches, which animals and humans eat. Without the sun, the Earth's entire food chain would collapse. Sun also provides oxygen for us to breathe through photosynthesis. Plants and phy phytoplankton uh, plankton use their sun's energy ab to absorb carbon dioxide, and then they give out oxygen for us to breathe through photosynthesis. Of course, if we didn't have the sun, there would be no source of oxygen for us to breathe. Also, sun provides heat. And the sun is the proper size and distance from Earth to provide us the perfect livable temperatures. If the sun was a different size, like if it was a red star, which most of the universe has, we couldn't, life wouldn't be possible, and it's the right distance from Earth. Without the sun, the Earth would plunge into a permanent freeze. Also, the sun's location in the galaxy. Here's an artist's rendition of the Milky Way, and this is where the sun is. It's the right part of the Milky Way to sustain life, because if, if it moved closer to the middle of the Milky Way galaxy, Earth would be bombarded by X-rays and gamma rays from the center of the galaxy. If the sun were further up out, its orbital period would no longer match the rotation rate of the Milky Way galaxy, and we'd be more likely to drift into our galaxy's spiral arms where radiation is higher. And our sun's orbit is circular. Elliptical orbit would cause drift into the arms. So overall, our sun is 
just the right type and just the right spot and just the right orbit to sustain life on earth. And Isaiah 45, 18 says, For thus says the Lord, who created the heavens, who is God, who formed the earth and made it, who, was not, who has established it, who did not create it in vain, who formed it to be inhabited. I am the Lord, and there is no other. Jeremiah 33, 22 says, The host of heaven cannot be numbered, nor the sand of the sea measured. Note, the scientists of Jeremiah's day may have ridiculed this teaching because with the naked eye, you could count at most 3,000 stars. But the teaching in Jeremiah says the host of heaven cannot be numbered, nor the sand of the sea measured. Why bring that up? Well, they, <coughs> they were wrong, and the Bible was right, because later with modern science, we know that the stars are so numerous we can't count. <clears throat> and here's a clip where Spike goes into declaring God's glory. He gets into the numbers of stars, the diversity of stars. It's <laughs> I found this amazing. Not to, it seems like no two stars are exactly the same. It's amazing in God's creative power, just like no two humans are unique, just like no two snowflakes are the same. It's even the stars so, and, and the size. So this will... Uh, highlight this, and this goes like four minutes. As it says in Psalm 19, the heavens declare the glory of God, and the firmament shows his handiwork. The universe does this in many wonderful ways. First, the Bible says that God has created so many stars that we couldn't count them any more than we could count the grains of sand on the beaches of the world. The prophet Jeremiah wrote that, the host of heaven cannot be numbered, neither the sand of the sea measured. At the time he wrote this though, this would have been considered ridiculous. There are only about 3,000 stars visible to the naked eye. So you can imagine Jeremiah writing this as God inspired him to do so, and then being ridiculed by the best scientists of his day. The best scientists of his day all knew that the stars could be counted because they had done so. But they were wrong, and the Bible is right. Thanks to better technology, we can now see an estimated 100 to 200 billion galaxies. Each galaxy contains about 100 billion stars. That's about 10 to the 22 stars in total. That's a one with 22 zeros after it. That's an incomprehensible number. If you could count one star per second, it would take you over 300 trillion years. This is far beyond human effort, and again we see that the Bible was proven correct even though for thousands of years, the best available scientific evidence seemed to contradict it. But even though the stars are uncountable, there are still a finite number of them. As Psalm 147 says, He telleth the number of the stars, He calleth them all by their names. Again, the Bible correctly refutes incorrect ideas. From the ancient Greeks all the way into modern times, there have been many scientists and philosophers who taught that the universe was eternal and infinite in size. Today we understand that although the universe is vast beyond our understanding, it is still finite in size, and it had a beginning. The Bible correctly describes our universe. The Bible also says that there is one glory of the sun, and another glory of the moon, and another glory of the stars. For one star differeth from another star in glory. Again, for most of human history, philosophers and scientists would not have agreed with this. Although a few stars show some variation, most of the stars that are visible to the eye don't look very different from each other. But again we see how the Bible gives a correct description of the universe. Thanks to better technology, we now know that stars have a bewildering diversity. Stars are found in various colors, white, blue, red, orange, and yellow. They vary in type, from white, brown, and red dwarfs, medium-sized yellow stars, and blue, red, and orange giants. Some are single, Many are in binary pairs. Others are found in multiple star systems. Stars vary in brightness, from brown dwarfs shining at less than one millionth the brightness of the sun, to R136A1, blazing 8.7 million times brighter than the sun. Stars vary in composition. They have different temperatures. They have different masses. They have variable spot activity. They have different rotation rates. 
They show different periods of solar cycles. They even differ in how they shine. Some shine steadily, others vary in brightness in regular cycles. There are billions of stars in the universe, in an amazing variety and diversity, and our Lord has named every single one of them. Stars are also found in an enormous variety of sizes. Here again we can catch a glimpse of the glory of the Creator. In our daily lives it's difficult to perceive the size and scale of the universe. The Earth alone is far bigger than we can really comprehend. Even though there are roughly 7 billion people in the world, the Earth is so big that every person in the world could fit into the state of Texas with more than 1,000 square feet per person. But even at that size, the Earth is small compared to Jupiter. And Jupiter is far smaller than our Sun. Our Sun is so big that you could fit over 1 million Earths inside of it. Yet the Sun is small compared to Sirius A, which is a brilliant blue-white star, the brightest star we can see in the sky. But even Sirius is dwarfed by orange giants like Pollux, Arcturus, and Aldebaran. And even these giants are tiny compared to such stars as Rigel, Antares, and Betelgeuse. Betelgeuse is as wide as 1,180 suns, but even Betelgeuse is dwarfed by the supergiant stars, including V.Y. Canis Majoris, the largest star we know of so far. For perspective, here's a comparison of our sun to V.Y. Canis Majoris. Pretty small. The variety and sizes of stars are enough to humble us before our Creator. But we should also consider how vast is the space in which God has placed them. So that humbles me when I see how God created that. And all he said is he made the stars also. So the message of the heavens. Which model fits the universe better? Creation or evolution? We'll use different qu quotes and then compare that with what the Bible teaches. Evolutionist says, The truth is that we don't understand star formation at a fundamental level. The Bible says in Psalm 33, 6, By the word of the Lord were the heavens made, and all the host of them by the breath of his mouth. Verse 8, Let all the e earth fear the Lord. Let all the inhabitants of the world stand in awe of him. And seeing that makes me feel in awe of the Lord. Verse 9, for he spake and it was done. He commanded and it stood fast. Evolutionist says, nobody really understands how star formation proceeds. It is really remarkable. The Bible teaches in Isaiah 40, 26, lift up your eyes on high and see who has created these things, who brings out their hosts by number. He calls them all by name. Evolutionist says, the formation of stars is one of the most fundamental problems in astrophysics. No current model can reproduce all of the observations. The Bible says in Isaiah 55, 9, For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. The evolutionist says the universe we see when we look out to its furthest horizons contains a hundred billion galaxies. Each of these galaxies contains an another 100 billion stars. That's 10 to the 22nd stars all told. The silent embarrassment of modern astrophysics is that we do not know how even a single one of these stars managed to form. And the Bible says in Psalm 147, 5, Great is our Lord and great in power. His understanding is without measure. A unique evolutionist said this, I suspect that the sun is 4.5 billion years old. However, given some new and unexpected results to the contrary, and some time for some frantic recalculation and theoretical adjustment, I suspect we could live with Bishop Usher's value for the age of the earth and sun. I don't think we have much in the way of observational evidence in astronomy to conflict with that. What he's saying is he could live with the 6,000 years because we don't have anything to refute it. Now I'll go into the last section, the spiritual message of the heavens, and I'll close with Spike's video, which was, it, it touched my soul. Uh, hopefully you guys get the same effect. But first we talk about the atheist and naturalistic view and what they say. It is very hard to realize that this all is just a tiny part of an overwhelming hostile universe. It is even harder to realize that this present universe faces a future extinction of endless cold or intolerable heat. The more the universe seems comprehensible, the more it also seems pointless. So you can see the uh, hopelessness here. 
Isaiah 44, 23 says, Sing, O heavens, for the Lord has done it. Shout joyfully, you lower parts of the earth. Break forth into singing, ye mountains. Let them praise the name of the Lord, for his name alone is excellent. His glory is above the earth and heaven. The atheist naturalist says, Our planet is a lonely speck in the great enveloping cosmic dark. In our obscurity, in all this vastness, there is no hint that help will come from elsewhere to save us from ourselves. That was Carl Sagan. Psalm 121.2 says, My help comes from the Lord who made heaven and earth. The atheist naturalist says, this is Stephen Hawking who, passed, who died this past week, We are such insignificant creatures on a minor planet of an average star in the outer suburbs of 100,000 million galaxies, so it is difficult to believe in a God that would care about us or even notice our existence. Psalm 23, 1 through 3, The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in the path of righteousness for his name's sake. An atheist naturalist says, this is uh, physicist Lawrence Krauss, we're just a bit of pollution. If you got rid of us, then the universe would be largely the same. We're completely irrelevant. John 3.16 says, For God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. Dr. Michelle Thaler says stars will burn out someday, and she uh, echoes the hopelessness. You know, it, it is so tempting. I mean, humans have done this for, for, for literally tens of thousands of years to think of the stars as eternal. The stars will all burn out someday. There's only a certain amount of stellar fuel, of hydrogen, the stars are burning through it, and then the stars as we know them will all die out in some trillions of years. And the universe will be dark for the rest of time, whatever that means. Psalm 8, 3 and 4 says, When I consider your heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars which you have established, what is man that you are mindful of him, and the son of man that you attend to him? When you think of how God created the universe so vast, and we're just on this tiny little pinprick of an earth, and you saw the comparisons. It's amazing that God would even care for us. Um, it humbles us. But John 1, 3, we're sp talking to Jesus, all things were created through him, and without him, nothing was created that was created. Colossians 1, 16, for by him all things were created that are in heaven, and that are in earth, visible or invisible, whether they are thrones or dominions or principalities or powers, all things were created by him and for him. And I'll end on this. The heavens declare the glory of God. That's a picture of the Hubble ultra-deep field, the Hubble Space Telescope. And he will describe, if you pick a grain of sand and put it at arm's length, that will block this much space. And there are hundreds, if not thousands, of galaxies out there. And imagine putting that everywhere around below your feet. That's how numerous the galaxies are. And then he'll end it and a touching message. To catch the tiniest glimpse of what this means, look at this photograph. This is called the Hubble Ultra Deep Field. It's a long exposure photo taken by the Hubble Space Telescope. Except for these few stars, every other object, blob, and tiny speck of light you see is a faraway galaxy. This photograph contains over 10,000 separate galaxies with a beautiful variety of sizes, shapes, and colors and each galaxy contains 100 to 200 billion stars. Yet this photo is of a tiny portion of the sky. How much of the sky does this represent? This entire photograph is the amount of sky that would be blocked from your view if you held a grain of sand above your head at arm's length. Now extend what you see here to the entire sky, not only from horizon to horizon, but also below the earth all the way around under your feet. And we are overwhelmed with what the Lord has done. But despite being the creator of this vast universe, the Bible tells us that Jesus made himself of no reputation and took upon him the form of a servant and was made in the likeness of men. And being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. The creator of this awe-inspiring universe humbled himself more than we can possibly comprehend to save us from our sins and to buy for himself a precious bride for all eternity. In doing this, he has glorified himself.
by demonstrating infinite compassion, infinite mercy, and giving a sacrifice of infinite value, offering it freely for us. In the words of the famous hymn, Amazing Love, how can it be that Thou, my Lord, should die for me? As we gaze out into a universe full of wonder, this is the true message we must remember. In more ways than we can possibly understand, truly the heavens declare the glory of God. That's it. Any questions or comments? I also put the link up here for the Trinity RPC YouTube channel where Dave is helping me post it. Yes? Well, they say from the Big Bang, um, and also exploding stars. No, the I'll cover that in a couple of weeks. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yes, Mark and then Mark. Yes, uh, you'll find evolutions. <laughs> Amen, I agree. And in fact, next week when we talk about the planets, <laughs> you'll see they invoke catastrophes almost on every planet, but that yet they won't believe in a global flood. Yes, Mark. Yeah, in fact, I'll talk about that in two weeks. Yeah. Or three weeks. Yeah. So what I'm wondering is the reason I think this is important is because the scientific theory points to God. Yes. Because you have the problem, as Mr. Soto pointed out, where did all this come from? There's no answer. Yes, right. Second thing is if you look at a tiny penis, yes. who threw that? Right. So you have kind of two pieces of evidence that point to God. One is the origin, and second is the, is the, the time who got it. So I think. Yeah. And they're, they're that up. Yes, they are. Yeah. No, in fact, I will do say some good words. Exactly what you're saying on the Big Bang th with the expansion, and um, and that'll get into how we can come up with the, the light travel time issue. I'll go to you. For the Dave? I found it interesting how they said that the planets of our solar system came into existence by basically agglomerating yes. as, it, as it circled. The thing is, um, we have lots of heavy elements on this planet, and the dust does not naturally turn right. into heavy elements. In fact, even though <laughs> there's proximity to nuclear fusion, 
up he's only up until you get to iron, 26 on the periodic table. So you actually produce energy um, when the fusion goes on. After that, it consumes energy. So to get the heavier elements, it's progressively harder. Yeah. And we've got a decent amount of them on our planet. Yeah. That's a real conundrum that scientists have a hard time explaining. Yeah. And I'll, I'll cover that as well next week. <laughs> yep. Yeah. Absolutely right. Yeah, Mark. Yes, yep, I'll cover that too. You're absolutely right. It's actually accelerating. <laughs> Any other comments before we end in prayer? Yes. I think a lot of people like to talk about the Big Bang and act that it had it, but I want to say that as far as the galaxy and the universe started, how giant it is and how unfathomable it is for evolution and creation. It's amazing how God says, and he made the stars also. Yep. Right. Yep. Okay.